You can give evil eye to your children. And obviously, you can give evil eye to others as well. And it's extremely, extremely common. Treating jinn possession. Treating jinn possession. A very, very useful thing when seeking a treatment for jinn possession and also siha is hijama. Is copying. Copying is extremely important. The Messenger وسلم, told us that the, uh, sh the shaitan, he flows through the veins of Adam. Of the, he flows through the veins of the son of Adam like his blood. This is how they pass through our body. And subhanAllah, sometimes you're doing cupping and you, the blood that you took out via the cupping, the hijama, if you don't know what it is, do some research inshaAllah, it's from the sunnah of the Messenger salam, And sometimes the blood which is removed, you can actually take out the jinn, is caught in that blood and the jinn comes out in the blood by the permission of Allah. Likewise, the sihab, the sihab comes out in the blood. If the sihab has been mixed in with the blood, then when you do the hijama, it comes out by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So hijama is very, very, very important. It's from the sunnah, there's a lot of natural health benefits to it as well, but especially if there is evil eye or magic involved, make, uh, have hijama once a month at least, if possible, twice a month, uh, if you have the ability. Likewise, Ikhwan, remember that there's no quick cure. You're not going to put a daviz on, and if somebody can remind me in the Q&A, the question is, why sometimes when we wear daviz, does the person get better? You say that daviz is haram and it's shik, why is it then that sometimes a person wears it and they get better? Somebody ask me that, inshallah, because we need to uh, speak about that topic. So there's no quick cure. There's no quick cure to magic gym possession. Some of the scholars have mentioned that the Messenger وسلم, was suffering with magic for over six months. If that's the Prophet والسلام, what about me and you? What about me and you? It's a lengthy uphill struggle. And sabr is so important. Patience is the name of the game when it comes to Rukya. You're going to go through up days. You're going to go through days where you feel suicidal. Days where you feel like you're on your deathbed. But you must keep going. So don't ever think that there's a quick cure. So that's the first thing. The second thing, check your aqeedah. Check your aqeedah. Are you upon the same aqeedah as the Messenger السلام, and his companions? Are you upon the sunnah? There's no quick cure, ya ikhwan. If you're innovating into the religion of Allah, don't expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his shifa down upon you. If you're committing shirk with Allah, don't expect the shifa to come down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your aqeedah must be correct. Remember the sword and the arm. Then you should make ruqya over yourself. And the method of making ruqya, this is another three hour topic in and of itself. But again, online, inshallah, I will leave the brothers with some details, some web addresses, some YouTube uh, videos where you brothers can go and see exactly how to make Rukya from the beginning to the middle to the end. A Rukya program, a 30 day Rukya program for you to perform upon yourselves. And I always say to people, make Rukya upon yourself first and foremost. Because of the hadith of the 70,000. And then if you're not able to do that, then you can seek assistance from somebody else. Make the Rukya. And really important, my dear brothers and sisters, finish your treatment. Finish your treatment. How often do we find somebody recites Rukya for a week, two weeks, three weeks, they feel a little bit better, so they stop. It's like you have a weed. If you pull the weed out, the, lead, the root in, the weed's going to grow back. You need to get rid of it from the source. Destroy it. Put your patience in Allah and be patient and keep going, keep going, keep going. Ultimately, what are you doing? You're reciting Quran. For every single letter that you recite, there are 10 good deeds. Alif, Lam, Mim is 30 good deeds. Why are you then turning away from it like it's something heavy and something difficult? Somebody suffering from cancer, he goes for chemotherapy, the difficulty that he faces seeking a cure. Yet why aren't we prepared to face that difficulty when it comes to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? An important principle, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَضَعْتُمْ Fear Allah to the best of your ability. The more you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the more you're going to benefit from your ruqya by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some other things, it's an opportunity for you to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah Jalla wa'ala, He tells us, you may love or you may hate a thing which is good for you, and you may hate a thing which is bad for you. Allah knows and you do not know. So you weren't practicing, you were away from the deen, and then somebody put magic on you, or you were possessed by a jinn. If it led you to praying five times a day, if it led you to tawheed and the sunnah, ultimately wasn't it good for you? Ultimately wasn't it good for you? Yes, you took some hardship, but it rectified your akhirah. If you had been upon that path which you were upon, you would have gone to the fire of Jahannam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you back to the religion, brought you back to the straight path via this adversity. As Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said, a trial which makes you turn to Allah is better for you than a blessing which takes you away from Allah. Sometimes we're blessed with wealth, we're blessed with other things, takes us away from Allah. But a trial which brings you back to Allah is actually good for you. Seeking a cure from magic, try and find the sihr. Try and find the magic. Like we mentioned, the contract is usually written down. If you can find the contract and destroy it, then you will. Uh, this is like a fast track way to seeking a cure from magic. If you can't, then just be patient, have cupping, make ruqya. You can recite over water. Zamzam water is best. You should be eating seven ajwa dates in the morning. The Messenger sallallahu told us that whoever eats seven ajwa dates in the morning, he will not be affected for the rest of that day by poison or by magic. It's all about tawakkul. The Prophet said it, it is the truth. But do you truly believe that what he said is the truth? Do you truly believe that because he said it, this is the truth? It's about your iman and your tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, with sihab, there's going to be jinn. So be patient. They're going to try and get you to commit suicide or have suicidal thoughts or give up on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't do that. Keep going and keep plowing ahead. Like I said, it's a lengthy topic and we'll skip over that. You can do some research inshallah. With regards to evil eye, the quickest way to get a cure for evil eye is to take the wudu water of the person who gave you the evil eye. And it's upon us. If a brother comes to me and says, I think you've made, I think I might have got evil eye from you, can you give me your wudu water? It is upon me, binding upon me, to give him my wudu water. If you're asked for it, the Messenger Alayhi told us that if you're asked for it, you must give it. So it's very, very important. Like Sahil, couldn't even lift his head, that's how serious it was. As soon as they got the wudu water and they poured it over him, he was cured by the permission of Allah. However, nowadays, you go ask a brother, you say, can I have your wudu water? How dare you, you've accused me of this, you, you this, you that, you this, that. He begins to abuse you. What the scholars have mentioned, and it's very beneficial, invite him to your house. Invite him to your house, give him some dates. The date stone, which has been in his mouth, take that after he's left, and dip it into a bucket of water and then pour that over your head and it will have the same effect by the permission of Allah. If you can't get his wudu water because he's not going to give it to you and you know for certain who it is, then you can give him a date stone, you can give him something like that, dip that into a bucket of water and then make ghusl with it and you'll be cured by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's important, ikhwan, to have a ruqya plan in place. Sometimes we are not very disciplined and we, uh, you know, we, we do it for one day, we don't do it another day, we do it one day. It's important to have a Rukya plan in place. And ask your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your friend to police you, to make sure that you're doing your Rukya. Because if you've got jinn possession, they're not going to want you to do Rukya. So you need to ask somebody else, make sure, keep on top of me, make sure that I do Rukya. Ikhwan, I want to cover some other topics now. We'll leave that topic there, inshallah. Like I said, there's a lot out there on the internet and there's a lot that you can read, inshallah, about these topics. I want to mention the, because I know I'm going to get asked about it, charging for Rukya. Is it permissible to take a payment for Rukya? We know from that hadith where the uh, Abu Sa'id al Khudri radiallahu anh, that the companions, they took a payment for Rukya. Okay? And they took some sheep and they were, uh, they were given this by the, uh, by the tribe's people. And the Messenger وسلم, said, you've done well, give me a portion as well. Give me some of those sheep and you take a portion. 
if it was haram, the Prophet ﷺ would never have taken those sheep. But, ya ikhwan, but, we have people today. You want ruqya? 60 pounds for an hour. You want ruqya? 100 pounds for an hour. You want ruqya? 200 pounds a session. And you've got to book, uh, block book five sessions, give me a thousand pounds up front. This is the situation that we have come to. We have ruqya clinics opening up left, right and center. The person doesn't have a job, he's claiming from the government on one side and he's charging you 50 pounds a ruqya for hour on the other side. And if you can't afford it, he's not making ruqya upon you. This is the situation now. We have a lot of frauds, a lot of fakes who are just using this and they spotted a gap in the market and they're charging the people. There's nothing wrong with charging the people, but charge the people that which they can afford. And if they can't afford it, do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Messenger Islam said, he from amongst you can help his brother, let him do so. And as for these Rukya clinics, big clinics which are opening up, you want an appointment, it takes you, you got a, there's a two month waiting list. Because the person is, is that busy. Sheikh uh, Saleh al Fawzan, Hafidhullah, who's asked about this. He said, La ya Jews, it's not permissible to have or open a Rukya clinic, and this is what you do. It's not from the way of the Salaf. It's not from the way of the pious predecessors. Rukya, you know, jinn possession and magic is not something that only arrived on our shores six months ago or two years ago. This is something which has been around for thousands of years. But we don't find from the pious predecessors somebody, this is his only job and he's dedicating himself and opening up a Rukya clinic in this way. Likewise, likewise, Sheikh Fawzan, happy the whole lot, he said, that this opens up a door of immense fitna for the Raqi. A door of immense trials and temptations. Because the vast majority of people who are, are afflicted are our sisters, unfortunately. But this is the situation. So this is charging for Rukya. Likewise, Rukya Audio. What's the, what's the point with Rukya Audio? If you just type in Rukya Audio into YouTube, you're going to get thousands and thousands of recorded recitations of people reciting Rukya audio. Rukya audio should only be used if you can't recite yourself. So if a reader rings me and they can't recite, I'll send them a link to some Rukya and say listen to this. Because they're not able to recite themselves. So it's the next best thing for them to listen to somebody. But Rukya is that which is recited yourself and that which somebody else might recite over you. But we've mentioned that that which you do for yourself is better. So make the Rukya upon yourself. Make the Rukya upon yourself. You can make Rukya on blowing on water. This has been narrated by the Salaf and the Prophet wasallam. He would recite uh, Ikhlas, Falaq and Nas. He would recite that over his, his own hands. He would blow onto his hands and then he would rub that over his body. And Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen was asked about this and he said there's no problem with this. This has been narrated from the pious predecessors. Likewise, Drink lots of Zamzam water. The Messenger وسلم, told us that Zamzam is for whatever you drink it for. So before you drink the Zamzam, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ya Ikhwan, I want to end this uh, presentation on the importance of dua. We don't make enough dua. Do you think Allah needs you to recite Surah Al Fatiha three times, Ayatul Kursi, Ikhlas, Falaq? Do you think Allah needs you to recite this before He sends down the Shifa? Allah is the one who created the heavens and the earth. He said, be and it is. Do you think that the illness that you're suffering with is too difficult for Allah to cure you? Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are not waking up in the last third of the night and praying the hajjah, and you are praying qiyam al layl if you're not waking up in the last third of the night, this means you don't want a cure bad enough. Because if you really wanted it, you would wake up at that time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest heaven in a way which befits His Majesty. And we affirm it and we don't interpret it and we don't you know, uh, compare it nor do we deny it. We affirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends in the last third of the night in a way which befits His Majesty. And He asks, who is there that is asking of me so that I may give Him what He wants? If you're not making dua at that time, then you don't want it bad enough. You don't want it bad enough. So make dua, ya ikhwan. Make dua. One of the things of a raqi is that he recites some people during the day and he stays awake at night making dua for them at night. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cures them. So it's so important. Never, ever, ever overlook the importance of dua. And uh, like I mentioned, ya ikhwan, 
if you want to know about the detailed, the detailed method of making ruqya, then uh, myself and brother Muhammad Tim Humble, we did a ruqya workshop. I think all 12 hours of lectures, they've all been uploaded online. So if you just type in ruqya workshop or something similar to this, uh, inshallah you'll be, you'll be able to get it. And we go through everything in a lot of detail. We, we dedicated about an hour and a half to the jinn. What are the jinn? Where are they? Who are they? What's their creation? Their nature? Their characteristics? Their involvement in magic? Etc. We detailed a whole hour, an hour and a half, just on da'weed. How to read an amulet. How do you know what an amulet says? Why does the magician need your name, your mother's name? These type of things. So I advise you, if you're really serious about this subject and you really want to know what it's about, inshallah, go online and, uh, and find those videos. And there's a lot of reading material on it as well. Um, ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. If you brothers and sisters have any questions, I think that we'll take some questions now. Uh, yes, I think so. Do you find that you get afflicted by Jin trying to send forces against you, trying to disrupt the, the Rahi, the, the one who recites. Yeah, Rahi. Um, the brother asks a good question. Do you find that as a Rahi or, or I don't know if you use the term, but somebody who is uh, making Rukya on others, do you find that uh, you yourself are afflicted? They do threaten you and say, "I'm going to come back for you," um, and you know, you watch once once you leave, I'm going to get your family, I'm going to come for your kids, I'm going to do X, I'm going to do Y, I'm going to do Z. But Akhi, this is where you simply say Hasbunallah wa ni'maluki And whatever Allah has written for me If He has written for me harm Then wallahi if everybody, everybody gathered together to benefit me They wouldn't be able to benefit me Against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for me And if Allah has not written it for me If you all gathered together to harm me You wouldn't be able to harm me Except with what Allah has already written So when they see that you put your trust in Allah And they're not you know, they're not going to be able to phase you in this way. You say, look, if it's written, it's going to happen. My death is written, if you're going to kill me, Bismillah, come. And if you're not, then you're not going to be, going to be able to do it. Don't waste my time. And then when you say that to them, they realize and then they, they give up. It's very much like uh, the dog's bark is much worse than its bite. By the permission of Allah. But this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who keeps us safe. We do our, uh, we do our uh, salawat and we do our adhkar and we make our dhikr. After that we put our trust in Allah and Allah is enough for us. And they do try, Hafi, they come in your dreams and they, they, you know, sometimes you'll come and you'll feel a twitch and a poke here and a prop there. But this is nothing. If this is all they can do, subhanAllah, uh, it's, it's, it's pathetic. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our protector. Yes, well, you said that someone, if you pray five times a day, that you are protected. Does that mean that no one can do black magic on you if you're praying five times a day and in a state of ruzu? We'll ask a question. If you pray five times a day, does this mean you're completely protected? The answer is no. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed more than five times a day. He was the best of creation. He was the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who was most fearing of Allah, the one who was most loving of Allah, and yet he was afflict afflicted by magic. So we should never ever feel invincible against magic. But if you're praying five times a day, you have the correct aqidah and you have uh, you have the correct uh, uh, you know understanding and following of the sunnah, then put your trust in Allah. You are more protected, shall we say, by the permission of Allah than somebody who is not praying whatsoever. Somebody who's not praying is just a sitting duck. As for you, they're going to try, and it's going to be a little bit more difficult for them. Oftentimes, you also find that the jinn try and get into a person and they're not able to because the person is close to Allah so they return back to the Sahih and say I'm sorry I can't get into him I can't deal with him because he's upon Tawheed and Sunnah so it is a protection for you Brother you wanted a reminder about Taweez some people say it works for them Ah Zakhlah Khair Yes Taweez Taweez We Let's talk about Taweez Ten men came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to offer him the Pledge of Allegiance the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accepted it from nine men and he never accepted it from one man. The man, he was amongst their group, he didn't know why. Why hasn't the Messenger accepted my bayah? He was wearing an amulet, he was wearing a daviz. He took it off and he broke it. And then he gave the Pledge of Allegiance. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accepted the Pledge of Allegiance and said, whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk. Whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk. On another occasion, 
The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came upon a man and he had a bangle around the top of his arm. The Prophet Alaihi Wasallam asked him, why are you wearing that? The man said, I have this disease, Wahina, it's like uh, arthritis. It's a problem with the bones. And I put this on and it protects me. The Prophet Alaihi Wasallam said, take it off for it can only increase you in your weakness. And were you to die whilst you are wearing it, you would never be successful. It will only increase you in your weakness. Two parts to this. Your weakness in your Iman. The fact that you think that this bangle is going to bring you benefit. Wearing it is only going to increase you in your weakness in your Iman. And likewise, the weakness that you're physically feeling is only going to increase you. It's not going to make you any better. And were you to die whilst you are wearing it, I would never, sorry, you would never be successful. What is success on your Muqiyama entering into Jannah? What is uh, uh, failure entering into the fire of Jahannam? Likewise, the companion Hudayfa, radiallahu anh, he goes to a man and he finds that he's wearing an amulet. He says, why are you wearing it? He says, because I had such and such an illness and now I feel better. And then he recited the ayah, Hudayfa, he recited the ayah at the end of Surah Yusuf. That Allah says, most of them do not believe in Allah illa wa hum mushrikun, except that they also associate partners with Allah. This is their understanding of amulets. This is their understanding of amulets. And then Huzayfa said, were you to have died whilst you were wearing that, I wouldn't have prayed your janazah over you. So subhanAllah, the point here, Ya Ikhwan, amulets are associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now somebody might say, what about the amulet that only has Qur'an on it? We say to this person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an that honey is a shifa. Why don't we take a tub of honey and tie that around your neck as well? Why? Because you need to use it the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent it down to be used. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran? Will they not read and reflect and ponder over this Qur'an? The Qur'an, it is to be read and implemented and followed. The Qur'an is not to be tied around our necks, Ya Ikhwan. This is not how the Qur'an is used. And for Allah is the highest of examples, but let me give you one more example. You go to the doctor, he gives you a prescription. You take the prescription, you tie it up, you put it into a leather pouch and you tie it around your neck. Is it going to benefit you? No. You haven't used it the way he intended it to be used. And for Allah is the highest of examples. But the point is, Ya Ikhwan, the Qur'an is not used like this. I have never ever opened an amulet and it's only Qur'an. One time I did and the paper had been urinated on and then they wrote the Qur'an. This is what they do. Other times you're going to open an amulet and there's, uh, it will say, Qul Allah, and then it is going to say, there's random codes, random letters. And then it's going to say something else from the Qur'an, random numbers, random letters. This is how it works. You're going to find grids, numbers, random shapes. This is the amulet. And even if it was Qur'an, you wear that and then you go into the toilet. You wear that and you have relations with your wife. This is not the way that the Qur'an was set down to be used. So amulets, we have established that they are not permissible in Islam. A person might say, yes, but I was suffering, I was possessed. And then I put this amulet on and now I feel absolutely fine. How do you explain that? How do you explain the fact that it worked and yet you say that it's haram? Let's go back to the creation of Adam alayhi salam. When Adam alayhi salam was created, وَإِذْ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمْ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ We told the angels to prostrate to Adam and they all prostrated. إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ Except for Iblis. In another, in another part of the Qur'an, he says, Allah, oh Allah, I'm better than him. You made me from fire, you made him from clay. I'm not going to prostrate to him. Then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him down from Jannah and said, you are accursed. He said, oh Allah, let me live until your Qiyamah. Let me live until your Qiyamah. Allah says, you're going to live until your Qiyamah. Iblis then says, oh Allah, because you sent me astray, I'm going to sit and wait for them on your straight path. And I'm going to come from their left and their right and in front and from behind. And you're going to find that most of them are not grateful. The point, Ya Ikhwan, what does Iblis want us to do? Commit shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to take as many of us with him to the fire of Jahannam. And he knows 
What's the fast track route for that? Inna Allah la yaghfiru ay yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika limay yasha. Allah will never forgive the one who associates partners with him. The one who commits shirk. So Iblis knows, get him to commit shirk. Another one bites the dust, he's with me in the fire of Jahannam. So, you have a shaitan with you or possessing you. You put the amulet on, you feel better immediately. Why? Because you have done exactly what that shaitan wanted you to do and commit shirk. You have done exactly what he wanted you to do. It's like if a dog barks and you throw the dog some meat, you've given the dog what it wanted. you fed it, you've given it what it wanted. Likewise with the shayateen, they want you to commit shirk. So you put this amulet on, don't, get, don't be surprised that you suddenly feel better because you've done exactly what it wanted. Now it's going to leave you alone and then you're going to be a subscriber for life. You're going to say, no, I, was, I was, had problems and I put the taviz on and suddenly I feel better. Now you're never going to take that taviz off. Now you're never going to take that taviz off. Likewise, with the, nobody's asked me but we'll deal with it. How does the exorcism of the Jews and the Christians work? Why does their exorcism work? Their books are Baqil. They've got shirk and kufr in their books. How most of them, most of it is. How does their exorcism work? How do you explain that the jinn leaves that individual? Because when he says, Oh Jesus, our father, oh son, our creator, they get them to commit shirk, the jinn leaves, knowing full well, these people are now going to be Christians for the rest of their life because what they think they have seen is Jesus, the Savior, the Son of God, saving this person. So now they're going to be Christians for the rest of their life. This is exactly how it works with amulets, Ya Ikhwan. You might jump out of the, the, the frying pan, but you're jumping straight into the fire. You put it on, you suddenly feel better. The second you come to Tawheed, the second that you decide to take it off, your problems are going to come back and they're going to be much, much worse than they were previously. So there's no such thing as this quick cure, Tawheed, etc. If ever it works, this is a plot from the plans of Shaytan. Uh, a couple of questions. One was from the audience, uh, brother, around uh, remote nuclear uh, through perhaps telephone or Skype. Remote Rukia. Um, this is something that we have, it is a, is a new phenomenon with regards to remote Rukia, Rukia via Skype, Rukia over the telephone. This is not from the way of the Salaf. Very simple. It's not from the way of the Salaf. However, however, if that person lives in the middle of nowhere, there's no Raqi there whatsoever, and there's no other option except for you to recite over the phone, it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. However, you know, don't if you're if you're in this country or anywhere in Europe or pretty much any country in the world, there is somebody who will be able to recite Quran over you, and you shouldn't need to resort to this type of rukya over the telephone, this type of rukya. Yes, the Quran is the shifa, but from the madhaj of the salaf is that they would recite. Likewise, from the sunnah, recite and then blow on the person, blow over water. You can't do any of this. Likewise. If that person begins <coughs> reciting on you and the jinn manifests and you start getting thrown from the you know from each side of the room, who's going to protect you? What's going to happen? If that jinn manifests and you go to the kitchen and slit your own throat, who's going to stop that? So you shouldn't do this type of rukya. You shouldn't do this type of rukya except in an absolute last resort situation. But I would even argue if you've got access to Skype, then you've got access to the Rukya audio, you've got access to people on the telephone, people uh, who can come and you can call them to do Rukya on you. There's a lot of things, yeah, Ikhwan, there's a lot of ways around it. The, the way and the methodology of the pious predecessors is enough for us. Allah um, We'll take some questions from the sisters now, shall we? Is it permissible to pay for hijama? Is it okay to go to a clinic? There are various narrations where the Messenger وسلم, said that the, uh, the, the earnings of the, the, the copper, they are filth. The earnings of the copper, they are filth. And, but then we have, on other, we have on the other side, the fact that the Messenger وسلم, he was cupped himself and he gave something to the copper. He gave uh, like a gift to the person who did the cupping. He gave him a payment. So the correct opinion when we make uh, jump between those two uh, ahadith or those two positions is that yes, if the person is using equipment, he's using cups and he's using pumps and other things which have cost him money, then yes, you should pay him and you can pay him for his time 
However, if the person does it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this will be best, but it's not, it's not haram or anything like that. And yes, you can go to a Rukya clinic, um, and there's nothing wrong with this, inshaAllah. If you are reading the Quran regularly, will this be a Rukya, or do you have to intend your recitation for a specific cure before reciting? إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّةِ Every action is according to its intention. You should make the intention to sit down and make ruqya on yourself. You should. There are, believe it or not, huffad, people who've memorized the entire Quran. They have jinn possession issues and they recite Quran on a regular basis and it's okay. Uh, they feel some twitching, some pains, but when they sit down with the intention of ruqya, for some reason, Allah knows best, they have a much greater reaction. So it's better to intend and sit down for the purpose of Rukia and you've got your water and your zamzam and your dates and things like that, that's better inshallah. We'll take one from the brothers now, inshallah. What if you have evil eyes from someone that you like don't know over like say a picture or something? It's a very good question. And the brother has uh, also brought something else up which is very beneficial. You have Rukia, so you have evil eye and you don't know who did it to you. You have evil eye and you don't know who did it to you. Likewise uh, over a picture, you know over a picture. Subhanallah, I want to deal with the picture business first. Facebook, Subhanallah. Today I went here with my spouse, my husband, my wife is amazing. I bought this car, it's the best car in the world. I'm going on this holiday, don't I look so beautiful in this selfie? Subhanallah, yeah, if one, you are setting yourself up for evil eye. You are setting, you are inviting evil eye upon yourself and your family. If you have a blessing from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, don't go out and flaunt this to the rest of the world. Because there are people who are not going to say MashaAllah to Allah. There are people who are not going to say Allahumma barik alayhi. They're not going to say this. And there are people with diseases in their hearts. They don't want to see you happy. Don't set yourself up for that, ya ikhwan. Don't flaunt all of these things. Aside from the issue of picture making and the severe warnings against that, and I know it's a difference of opinion, but aside from all of this, don't set yourself up for evil eye for hasad and this type of thing. The brother asks a good question, you don't know who did the, the gave you the evil eye. In this situation, you would just make ruqya over yourself and the ruqya for evil eye, the, we have the, the what we call the universal ayat. Things like uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, Ayat Al-Kursi, the last two of Surah Al-Baqarah, the uh, Surah Ikhlas and Mu'awwidatayn. Uh, you also have things like drinking zamzam water, making dua from experience. Uh, washing your face with zamzam water, so taking a bit of zamzam on your face, washing that is also beneficial. All of these things, Ya Ikhwan, inshallah you can find this all online um, and it's fairly easy to find, inshallah. Yes, sir. Uh, my question was, uh, if, uh, could you seek help from people abroad, especially from the question I asked, if somebody says, oh, if you give me, oh yeah, I can tell you, this person done a magic on you, and that's what they look like, but they never met the person. Are they themselves are doing the magic? Who can actually can derive this Good information? Question. Can you ask somebody who's living in a different country? Um, can you ask them about sihar? You know, I want I want to know about magic. Uh, have I had magic done on me? Is it is it permissible if that person is doing it? What's the ruling on that person? Ikhwan. SubhanAllah, it's impossible, and I say this again, it's impossible for you to know that somebody is doing ruqya, uh, somebody is a magic on you or you're under possession of magic and somebody is sitting in a different country. It's absolutely categorically not possible. Okay? This person, if he says this, then A, he's either seeking the assistance of the jinn or B, he is a liar and he is making it up from his own self. It's impossible to know what's going on, whether the sihar, etc. It's not possible to know what's going on with this. What this person will do, if he is a, a person who's using jinn, he will ask your name and your mother's name. His jinn will then go and they will try and find out about you. And they will go and they will try and identify who you are. And then based on this, he will also Try and do what is known as fortune telling. And to summarize the lengthy hadith, the Messenger وسلم, told us how fortune telling works. The jinn, the shayateen, they make a chain. 
and they go all the way up to the heavens. They go all the way up right to the lowest heaven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He commands something, the angels, they beat their wings out of fear and awe of Allah. And once the fear has left their heart, they ask one another, what did your Lord say? What has your Lord commanded? And then they say the truth and He is the Most High. And then they mention some of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, decreed. The jinn, they try and listen in to what the angels are discussing between themselves. And the one at the top who's listening, he passes it down to the one underneath him. And that chain, and it gets passed all the way down. Either they will get hit by a shooting star, a shooting star, the shooting star that we see flying across the sky. They will get hit by that and completely obliterated. Or they will return it back to the ear of the soothsayer. And the Messenger ﷺ said, they tell him 99 lies and one truth. They tell him 99 lies and one truth. Imagine we had a massive chain, a massive chain from here to Birmingham, for argument's sake. Just giving you an example. And somebody in Birmingham said something. Somebody in Birmingham said something. And then the chain carried it all the way back to you people in Reading. Everybody who goes along, he adds a little bit of his own, you know, his own spice to the mix. It's not going to be what was said at the beginning. Maybe in general terms, yes, but it's going to be miles away. It's not going to be specific. I'm just giving you an example. Likewise with the shayateen. When they put it into the ear of the soothsayer, they tell him 99 lies and one truth. He tells the people, the people who are weak in Iman, this is what's going to happen tomorrow. And he's very general in what he says. When something like this happens, they forget the 99 lies that he got completely wrong. And they remember the one they say, wow, he told us that. And they forget everything that he got wrong. And they hold on, because of their weakness of Iman, they hold on to the one truth. So this is what the person he will do. He will say to you, yes, brothers, that, you know, your, your brother, your sister, or there's magic done on you. And the next thing you, you all know what it is, and I can treat you if you give me 5,000 rupees. I can treat you if you give me this. I can do this for you, I can do that for you. If you bring me over and pay me this much, yeah, if one, I know people who have mortgaged their house to pay these false people. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand pounds and they've been seeking a cure. Do this for me. Oh, I need to buy something and it's engraved in gold, it's going to cost you 10,000.